Hello everyone, welcome to Creation.Live. I'm your host, Trey. In each episode of this show, ICR scientists gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be ICR's current research, something new that's come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that ultimately impacts how science points to our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. I have with me today uh, my co-host, Michael. Thank you, Trey. Uh, our special guest, David Reeves. Thank you. And uh, our very own physicist, Dr. Jay Kiebert. Yeah. Thank y'all so much for being here today. No, it's great to be here. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, you are the founder of David Reeves Ministry, ministry that bears your name. Uh, and I know that it is very wide ranging uh, in the amount of media and the topics that it covers. Uh, but before we talk about the ministry, I'd like to talk about you a little bit. Um, what led you in that direction, if you will? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I was really raised with good influences. I always loved history to a certain um, extent, but I guess it would have to be around eight, nine years old, and I had just moved to the Middle Tennessee area. And I'm digging in my family's backyard, just kind of poking around, and I started to find these little crinoids, little sea creatures, you know, little bivalves and imprints of shells and little pieces of coral. And I'm picking these things up and I'm like, wow, you know what? There's no water around me. This must have come from Noah's flood. You know, this, this is really neat. And at eight years old, I started putting them in a little fishing tackle box. <laughs> And, Very own and collection. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, creating my own little collection. Then once I got too many to fit in a little tackle box, I started to put them in a big one of these tough boxes that goes in the back of pickup trucks. And I printed me out a little sign. It said Reeves Fossil Museum. <laughs> and I would tackle anyone who came near my house, and I would be like, "You got to come look at these fossils from the flood. Check this out, right?" And um, I guess that's how it sort of got started. My interest in science. But really, about 10 years old, my family got a telescope. I started looking at uh, the comet Hale-Bopp, at things like, uh, you know, galaxies and nebula that are easy to see through smaller telescopes. And then, at I guess it was 16, 17 years old, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I'm, I'm sitting there, I've got a number of passions, but I just really don't know where my life's headed. And I start to take pictures of space, astrophotography. I start to connect cameras to the back of telescopes. And then the telescopes got a little bit bigger and the cameras got a little bit better. And before long, I finally got this really, really nice shot of the Great Orion Nebula. And my jaw hit the floor because I'd seen these things in Sky and Telescope Magazine, NASA, space photography. And I'd always said, you know, here I am, 16, 17, and I'm always like, yeah, they, they probably colored that a little bit. It, it can't look quite that good, you know? And boom, I take the picture for myself through my, using my own equipment, and I'm blown away. And I'm like, it really is there. And it really is just this beautiful and this wonderfully designed. And I said, this reminds me of Psalm 19.1. Psalm 19.1 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. It says that day after day is uttering speech and night after night shows knowledge. But you know what? There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's what Psalm 19 tells us. So in other words, the heavens are literally screaming out at us, maybe not literally, but figuratively screaming out at us that there is a designer. Because today we live in a society where we're told we're your star stuff, you know, over the, chan the result of billions of years of evolution. <laughs> and, and I have to ask myself, maybe this is one of the reasons our society has been so plagued. So at, at 17, 18 years old, I said, why is this a hobby? Why am I keeping this selfishly? Couldn't I use this as a way to witness to others? And my brother, Murray, um, he's a year older than I am. So I'm about 17, he's about 18. We, we start this plan and we form the ministry, 501c3 nonprofit. I began speaking local churches, little, little places. Actually, not, not little. First, first time that I got an invitation to speak, it was, uh, I guess, at First Baptist in, uh, no, Eastern Hills Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, we're normally you know seventy people on a Sunday night. Come out, come on out and speak, you know. And I, I'm driving down to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and as I get into the city, 
these electronic billboards have my picture on it. It says, famous astronomer speaking tonight at the church. <laughs> and I'm, I'm 18 years old, yeah. all right? <laughs> so I show up, and oh, it's you know, 70 people on a Sunday night. No, there's 550 people oh, filling wow. this entire sanctuary. And this was my first time really presenting. And uh, the Lord just opened up so many doors past then. He's led me all around the world since then, has allowed me to host some uh, TV shows that have gone out to hundreds of millions of households around the world and produced some documentaries. So, I mean, from those tiny little beginnings and a picture of a nebula, that is where I'm standing here today. It's taken me around the world. Awesome. That's, that's an amazing story. Like, just the step of courage that it takes <laughs> and then how God blesses that, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so then that leads you to uh, David Reeves' ministry and... Man, 18, I can't even imagine the fear that I would feel standing on that stage. But uh, so what all does David Reeves Ministry do? I know that there's a lot of different multimedia type stuff. I know that you've written a couple of books. Yeah, I've, I've written a couple of books. Um, one looks at 21 verses scattered throughout the scriptures that really holds scientific authority, right? After thousands of years, those verses are still 100% scientifically true, just as the rest of the Bible is. Uh, and the other book focuses a little bit more on astronomy, problems with Big Bang chronology, things like that, which, Jake, I know is one of your passions. Yeah, uh, right. So, I mean, we've connected on a number of times just because of the astronomy issue. But uh, that's always been where I go back to is, is astronomy. It's such a powerful example of the grandeur of our Creator. So we have written a few books, produced uh, about 800 to 1,000 pieces of media uh, in the last 15 years. Um, we really are a media ministry. Uh, TV, documentaries, uh, the latest documentary was fo focusing on animals of Alaska with Dr. Joe Martin. And um, we have a TV network about six, seven years ago. I'm trying to think because the trademark just got renewed. But I guess it was about six years ago. I'm watching Discovery Channel. And I like Discovery Channel. I like the right. science that it has. And yet, at the very end of all of these good scientific facts, at the end of every program, they stick in this little atheistic jab. It's like, you know, and, and your star stuff, the result of evolution, or uh, all of this happened through natural selection over millions of years. Always this little jab, you know? And I was talking with my brother, and I was like, well... Why is that? Why is it that National Geographic and Discovery Channel and NOVA and PBS and NASA TV, all of these things have to come at it from this perspective, even though they've got all of this good scientific data? And then over the next few days, it was like, why couldn't we have our own television network? And we formulated this plan, and my brother and I formed Genesis Science Network about six years ago. Within three months of just an idea it was actually a fully functioning 24-7 television feed, first online, and then within a few months later, it had hit Roku and Amazon Fire TV, and it was being picked up by TV stations around the country and rebroadcast on terrestrial TV. And the next thing you know, hundreds of thousands of people are downloading these Roku apps and watching this television network 24-7. First thing I did was, we've produced a lot of television content over the years. Uh, I mean, uh, nearly a thousand pieces on our own. So we've got a lot of material. But at the same time, I reached out to ICR and other ministries, and I asked them, would you consider working with us? And ICR said, here's every video, every DVD, every movie that we've ever done. Play it. Yes, let's help people. And that has been such an amazing thing because here six years down the road, I, I still get probably a dozen testimonials every week from Genesis Science Network, from people watching. I've had letters and emails from people who said, David, we, we've we been watching uh, Genesis Science Network and, and uh, we appreciate you making it free because a lot of people that really need to know would never pay to watch something like this, right? Religious content. Uh, but we just want you to know that it's given us the boldness to go out and present uh, not only the gospel, but the truth of creation to other people, and there have been salvation reports. In fact, we've had salvation reports from people watching Unlocking series 
on Genesis Science Network, taking it back to their church, teaching a course on Genesis where their unbelieving grown son attended that course at that church and accepted Christ. So it's been remarkable to see the way the Lord's used that branch of, of our ministry over the last few years. I speak in churches and conferences all over, uh, one week speaking tours in different countries. I lead a, uh, every other year I lead an African photo safari uh, to South Africa, look at all of the wildlife and also the stars. Um, and every year I lead a paleontological dig, uh, sort of a dinosaur dig into Kansas where uh, we, we dig up these massive, mostly marine fossils. In but, Kansas. Uh, in Kansas. <laughs> well, You've actually well, been out yeah, there right. with me. That's right. Uh, and we're stepping on millions of sea fossils in the middle of Kansas. Now, Not, you know, yeah. even the secularists are gonna say, oh, well, David, we, we know, yeah, there, there was a lot of water in Kansas at one point in the distant past. Must have been a giant sea, uh, like an inland sea. They, they, call it a mar it's a, they call it a marine <laughs> transgression. It's yeah. almost like they're afraid to use the word flood. Exactly. It's like there's a sort of this psychological block against calling it a flood. If you yeah. don't use that word, you yeah. can't point to the global flood, right? Right, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. there is a transgression, transgression happening. Marine transgression is kind of a sanitized, <laughs> but it's, sanitized euphemism for it. Yeah. It's a sanitized version of saying marine transgression, water, came all the way up into Kansas and beyond. They all agree they just don't want to call it a flood. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, other than that, there's there's a lot of aspects of our ministry. We, we actually... Um, about seven or eight years ago, uh, we started the Creation Club as a, as a community for other authors and talented writers to share information on creation. And that's turned into a bi-monthly magazine that we send out free of charge called the Creation Club Magazine. Um, we, a few years ago, we started the Creation Superstore. And it was first this online store with an ambitious title, right? Creation Superstore, right? But the Lord's really blessed it. Since then, we've become the largest Origins-related store in the world. We're stocking, selling, shipping globally. I think it's over 1,500 different books and videos. That's everything incredible. you've ever written, everything. <laughs> that, I mean, it's like it's just a one-stop shop yeah. for creation. We're just trying to get the word out there any way we can because today science has become this major stumbling block for the last couple of generations probably. And that stumbling block is because these, they, these people want to appear intellectual. I talk to intellectual atheists all the time. And the reason they're atheists is because they believe that's the intellectual position to take. And once you're able to show them that all of science is screaming these patterns of design, but not just patterns of design, because if you stop there, then you might say, well, well oh, aliens, right? But these patterns of design that are specifically aligning with what God's Word, the Bible, has already told us for thousands of years. And ultimately, what that means is it's not just design. It's designed by the God of the Bible who tells us who He is, who loved us so much that He came to this earth to live, die, and be raised again so that we could be a part of His family for eternity. Yeah. And so we're, we're trying to share the gospel in different ways and use science as an avenue to to raise intrigue, you might say. Amen. Yes. Well, all the things you've talked about thus far with your ministry, the things you've written and spoken about, and same to you, Dr. Heber, um, about the Bible's accuracy. So we talk about science, we talk about the Bible. Well, really, there's not a, con from our perspective, there's not a conflict between the two. When we talk about, you know, science and scripture, why do you think the Bible's accuracy is so under fire today? And Either of you can chime in on this. Well, you know, in politics, we, during the primary season, you always go after the front runner. <laughs> you know, you don't see people attacking the Book of Mormon or the Hindu scriptures or uh, any of these other, or even Scientology. <laughs> well, a few people are attacked Scientology. <laughs> but they attack the Bible. And, you know, to me, that's almost a tip-off that deep down everybody knows that of, that of all the religious books out there, that's the front runner. If there's a book out there that is the Word of God, the Bible is the front runner. And so they just attack it. And I, th I think the very fact that they spend so much time attacking it is a backhanded admission that it stands above all these other religious documents. Yeah, I, I agree. Dr. Werner von Braun, 
He said a lot of people look at science and religion as antagonists. He said they're not. They're sisters. While science tries to better understand creation, the world around us, religion tries to better understand the creator. Okay. So when you realize that they go hand in hand and you can't really look at creation without acknowledging there's a creator, you can't see design without saying there has to be a designer. So that's the reason you would attack it, is if you don't like the designer, the God of the Bible. You go with this naturalistic view and try to say, well, somehow we've got to explain everything via nature. That's right, and then the accountability, too. What, what about a moral code, and where does yeah. all that come from? If there's no designer, it's the and the difference. Bible's not true. It's the difference yeah. between absolute morality and objective morality, right? It's the lie from the very beginning, hath God said. Did God really say this? You know, all you have to do is eat the fruit from that tree and you can be just like him, okay? So who doesn't want to have all of the power, right? And if you have all of that power, then you're not accountable to anyone. So that very, very uh, appealing sense of wanting to make our own rules, of wanting to have objective morality, what's What's right for you might not be right for him, but what's right for me, nobody can attack that because that's my truth, yes. you see? It's your truth. And <laughs> I, mean, I, I need to point a clarification here. You're calling it objective morality. Yeah. Would subjective be a better word for it? Or Ooh. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I know there's a, this philosophy of uh, objectivism out there. I don't know if that's got anything to do with what you're talking about, but uh, I'm wondering, is it more... Subjective. Yeah, subjective. Mm. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just not sure. Yeah, wondering about the It's terminology. objective for me, and it's objective for you, but they may not align, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but the idea of absolute morality does not appeal to most people. It's, it's kind of like they're suppressing the truth of the Creator. Romans and, 1. Yeah, yeah. It, it, Romans 1. Yeah. And worshiping the created thing more than the Creator. We see through every civilization, just look, the Romans, the Greeks, the Assyrians, they worshiped the sun, the moon, anything that was created. They would make gods out of anything. And today, what are we doing? We're actually doing the exact same thing. We're making gods out of sports, or we're making gods out of natural selection. Ooh, Mother Nature can accomplish anything. Or we're making God, anything except the God of the Bible. You know, uh, in the last few years, I've actually heard people uh, talk about the universe as if it's God. Like thanking the, un you know, when they found the Higgs boson, one of the scientists there said, I, I'm, I thank the universe. And, and then there was another <laughs> one where a Hollywood actress not too long ago said, you know, she, uh, basically thanking the universe for, it's just, it's amazing. Wow. It's really amazing. It's uh, kind of in your face. Worshiping the creature yeah. more Anything than Anything but a creator. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we've talked a little bit about how, why, why the, the Bible's accuracy is under fire. So I wanna hear from both of y'all, what in your experience and your various experiences is the like best or your favorite uh, counter argument to that? Like, hey, this shows that the Bible is 100% accurate. <laughs> so I know that's a big question, the, but. The best, wow. You yeah. know, I, I, I do list 21 of my favorite in my second book. And as I was researching through that book, you know, I came across the passage, um, the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. And when I hit that verse, I'm like, oh no, no, I must be, I must be reading this wrong because I know that not all life, all, not all living things have blood. And I, I'm like, no, the the Bible knows best. Clearly, it's inspired by God. It has the right answers. I must be missing something, but this seems to be an error right here because the, it, not all life has, has blood. What am I missing? And then it hit me. The life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Because, yeah, there are some creatures that don't have blood, like sea sponges, but those creatures don't have flesh. So can you believe that God in his infinite wisdom would have inspired the authors of that book to write down not just that life has blood, because then it wouldn't be entirely accurate, but also to write that the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. I mean, it just seems like everywhere we look, we're seeing these clues that point back to accuracy of the scriptures. Thousands of years of scientific research have only shown the accuracy of the Bible, never that it is somehow proven false. 
Yeah, for me, uh, I, I don't, boy, it's hard to know if I can say a single thing, but I really like um, facts that show, not, not just intelligent design, but show that the Bible's history is correct. You know, evidence for the flood, um, evidence for uh, the dispersion of tongues at the Tower of Babel. Yes, there's, you know, that kind of stuff, I just um, eat it up. It's, it's amazing, you know. Uh, evidence for the conquest of Canaan, you know. Uh, you know, the fact that the geological evidence at Jericho is just what you would expect. Yeah. Uh, it, it's amazing. It's really remarkable. And the deeper we dig, the more we find yeah. that is in support. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like we read in Leviticus. It says, uh, every earthen vessel wherein a dead thing falls, break the pot. So God's commanding the Israelites, if a dead animal falls into a piece of earthenware jar, to break the pottery, Okay. Right, it sounds like a waste. Is this just some oppressive God trying to put rules on his people so he can then punish them if they don't do what he says? What is going on here? You know, and there's no explanation for that because he knows what's right and he told the Israelites what to do. He doesn't need to explain himself. But at the same time, is there not scientific truth there? I mean, we're talking about thousands of years ago. Now, I've been to Israel a dozen times. I picked up hundreds and hundreds of pieces of pottery. And every time you pick up a piece of pottery, I look at it. 99 times out of 100, it's unglazed. Well, glazing is the process that seals the earthenware nature of the pottery, right? It keeps bacteria, microbes, from entering into that earthenware. The Israelites didn't have the, the ability to glaze their pottery or the funding to glaze their pottery. So it was just earthenware. Well, if some dead animal is falling into this, this piece of pottery, uh, there's no telling what disease it died from, what's going on here, right? So these germs and microbes are basically seeping into these earthenware pots. The next person that eats out of that pot is getting the diseases of whatever animal was in there. So God commands, break the pot. The very next verse says, if it's clothing or something that you're not going to be eating out of, wash it, use it again. All right, so when you realize that germ theory wasn't even really proposed or well postulated until the 1800s by a Bible-believing creationist, by the way, uh, then you realize that the Bible knew best thousands of years before we could have even possibly understood why that verse was written. So we didn't understand it. It sounded like an oppressive God putting arbitrary rules on his people, but in reality, he was protecting them from disease when he knew that might be a problem. Isn't that amazing? And there's no way that the authors of the scriptures would have known that, right? That's what people always tell me, you know, atheists come up to me after I speak and they're, they're like, David, you're a Christian. You believe in this uh, collection of myths written by ancient goat herders over goat hundreds herders. of years. Yeah, <laughs> yes. the goat herders thing. To which I always reply, I agree with you on a portion of it. You know what? You have a, a little bit of this correct. I am a Christian. I do believe in a collection of books written over long periods of time by multiple writers, and those authors were goat herders. They were poets. They were kings. They weren't scientists. Yet somehow, they got the science 100% correct. They got the history 100% correct. They got the prophecy 100% correct. They got the gospel message 100% correct. How is that possible if it is just a collection of books? But if it is what it claims to be, the inspired word of God, then we would expect exactly what we are finding within the scientific community, within archaeology, within history, within all of these different fields. And to me, that's so encouraging. We have faith, right? We're Christians. People say, David, I, I don't need any of this stuff. I've, I'm a Christian. And, and I, to, <laughs> to which I always say, again, I agree with you. I have faith. What I'm reading here is true from beginning to end. Absolutely. No problem. At, but here's the difference. It is not a blind faith. The evidence is literally all right. around us. All you have to do is open your eyes and you see these evidences portrayed in everything that we're finding in every major scientific field in the cutting edge research in biology, genetics, astronomy, archeology, span geology, everything, it's like it is being opened up so that there is no excuse for any of us. You know, uh, getting back to the point of a Christian saying they don't need this, um, you know, that may be true, but the unsafe people you're trying to witness to do need it. Uh, one of the things that I'm really kind of startled by 
in uh, modern day evangelicalism is that when we present the gospel, there is often no attempt whatsoever to convince the listener that the message is true, which blows me away. Uh, you know, we, we, we say, oh, yeah, you need to make a decision for Christ. And uh, it's like, well, you know, would, you're, you're talking about something that is like the most life changing thing possible. Um, would you be okay with your daughter uh, marrying a guy an hour after he, he met her? You know, she yes. met him. And you're telling people they need to make a life altering commitment to Christ but you've made no attempt whatsoever to convince them the message is true. You're just appealing them to, you know, quote unquote, make a decision. And, uh, you know, I don't see how you can believe the gospel if you're not convinced that it's true. And I've been bothered by this for a very long time. It's like uh, there's this uh, downplaying of, you know, the need to be convinced that the message is true. I mean, uh, the New Testament places, I think, a pretty high emphasis on that. That's right. And um, now I do believe that repentance, I think repentance brings you to a place where you're able to believe. You know, I, think, I think there's a reason that in the New Testament, John came preaching a baptism of repentance, you know, because there's something about that that makes it, I think, easier for you to believe, that prepares your heart for that. But nevertheless, um, you know, you still need to be convinced of the message. Why did Jesus do all those miraculous signs? It was to convince people that he was telling the truth about himself. And so I just think it's kind of weird that we modern-day evangelicals Shy act away. like it's not like it's not important, like it's not doesn't matter. And even if it does, but even if it doesn't matter for you, it matters for the people around you. That's exactly right. These are faith builders that we can use when we go out to witness. Yeah. Okay. When we realize that, yes, the Lord has to convict the person, but at the same time, if we're witnessing to someone and we can use this for His glory, then we need to. You know, the, the, the example I like to bring up is Thomas, yeah. all right? We're talking about someone who said, you know, unless I see it, unless I touch Him, I'm not going to believe this. And what did Jesus say? Did he condemn him? No. Did, did he say, okay, well, Thomas, you, I'm just going to have to push you aside? No, he said, you need the evidence to believe, don't you? Come here. Let me show you the evidence. Yeah. Touch this. Yeah. I will show you. And so when you realize that his example actually used evidence when evidence was needed, yes, there's a faith element but if we do not use everything at our disposal when witnessing to others, so that skeptic, that coworker, that family member, then we're missing out on something really, really special. Yeah. And also, when you consider if the accuracy of the Bible can be doubted in one small part, yeah. then it affects the whole thing. Um, if it if it doesn't if it makes someone not want to believe, at the very least, it might even make them ineffectual. They they're like they're not confident in their mm -hmm. own faith. For sure. I'd love to hear some practical examples. So for our viewers and listeners and my own selfish benefit here, um, can you give an example from your experience with evangelism? I'm going off script. Can you, from, from evangelism's perspective, um, how do you practically engage someone? Um, people use the Romans Road or the Ten Commandments. What other methods have worked for y'all? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's so much a method, but when I witness to people, I try not to assume that the person is convinced the gospel is true, even if they've grown up in church. Because I have asked, I've talked to a bunch of people, and these are people who've grown up in church, uh, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, maybe even Lutheran churches, Catholic churches, whatever. And I ask them point blank, are you 100% certain that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be? Most of them say no. And... You know, I don't, I don't see how you can say that you believe in Christ if you're not sure that He is who He claimed to be. Uh, so to me, it's, it makes me wonder, you know, are we, are we missing something here in the way we're doing evangelism? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. I, I think that, uh, I think, again, that there's been so much taught in the public school system, in universities and colleges that have slipped in this little bit of doubt, right? And that little bit of doubt is a powerful thing because then every time you encounter something, you're like, 
yeah, but my professor, who's pretty smart, he told me that, right? And even though my pastor says, yeah, then that makes sense, yeah, and that, but my professor, when it comes to science, is a whole lot smarter than my pastor. Uh, and so why, why shouldn't I question everything that I've been told in church? And again, that really messes with your mind. I'll do, um, I mean, we've had millions upon millions of views on TikTok, which is predominantly 13 to 30 year olds uh, looking at these short videos where I'll just use some bit of scientific proof and point it back to a Christian perspective. And I'll have you know, all of these atheists and agnostics, young people who are uh, mocking and then I'll have this subset of agnostics who are like, normally, David, Christian content turns off, us off, but what you actually said makes sense. And I'm like, I know it does. Give me a call, right? And, and occasionally, some of these agnostics, these 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds and who are questioning, will call up the office. They'll forward them over to me, and I'll talk to them, and I'll be able to reason with them and tell them that this atheistic viewpoint is not the intellectual high road. It does not hold the answers to life and death or anything else. And it also, <laughs> it also keeps you back from the most precious thing, eternal life. Uh, so I really think that we do need to rethink the way that we're doing evangelism. Uh, obviously, people have had great success, but we're seeing something going on in society today where that success rate is going down, where we are losing these last few generations. Could this not be the key? Could this science aspect not be the, the linchpin, the key uh, to changing the tide? I think it might. Is this maybe a symptom of making converts instead of disciples? As far as, you know, we are called to give a reason for yes. what we believe. Yes, you have to start somewhere, right? If you can only get them to understand that there is another side. Then, perhaps, in two months from now, their friend who's been trying to get them to go to church might get them to go to church, right? If that happens, then six months from then, you, you see, you never know what, you, what path, what part of that journey you're playing in someone's life. Just because you think, oh, well, man, I didn't lead them to Christ. I didn't. Your position, your part of their journey might have been just to make them think. I'll give you an example. Um, I was filming at the Lee's Ferry at the starting point of the rafting trips down the Colorado River, right at the very start of the Grand Canyon. And after I got through filming, um, we turned off the cameras and I saw this lady loading up a raft in the distance. And I said, well, okay, well, I guess I'll just go over there and uh, see what's going on. So I walked over there and I said, what you doing? And she said, oh, I'm loading up this raft. We're getting ready for a 16 day journey down the Colorado River. And I was like, wow, I don't even know if I could handle 16 days. That sounds like a, a really, really big. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. She said, what are you doing? So I thought, hey, this is maybe an opportunity. I said, you know, I'm actually doing some on location filming, uh, looking at how this canyon may have been formed with a massive amount of water over a short period of time. And, uh, and she said, oh, okay. And then she starts loading her raft again. I'm like, okay, missed the opportunity. But in my peripheral vision, I see this tall, lanky fella come storming up because he'd been listening to us from behind a Jeep in the distance. So he comes storming up and he said, did I hear you say that you think that this canyon formed over a short period of time with a lot of water? And I said, yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence to indicate that. He said, my PhD is in geology. And I'm here to tell you that this canyon formed over six million years of slow, gradual uh, erosion from this Colorado River forming these canyon walls. And I said, um, well, I understand you believe that, but is it okay if I ask you a couple of questions? He said, certainly. Anything. What would you like to know? I said, well, have we ever seen a canyon? form over six million years of slow, gradual erosion from a river like this, something like this from something like this. He said, well, certainly not. We as a species haven't been around for six million years to observe such a thing. You're happening. correct. I said, but you, you do believe that it took six million years to form, right? He said, well, of course I believe that. I said, is it okay if I ask you another question? Oh, anything. What, what would you like to know next? Yeah, <laughs> well, he hasn't already answered this one. All right, well, I said, is there any test 
any kind of a, a laboratory simulation that we could do to try to simulate a, a river like this forming a canyon like this over six million years of slow, gradual erosion. Something straight up and down like this from some river like this. And he said, well, well no, there's no laboratory simulation or test we can do. I said, but you still believe that it took six million years to form this canyon from this river right here, right? And he said, well, of course I believe that. I said, well, you believe it by faith. And he said, well, of course. <laughs> two questions. That's all it took. Two questions. And all of a sudden, he's realizing that he has a faith-based belief that is not repeatable, observable, demonstrable, empirical. It doesn't hold up to scientific the scientific method. He's only believing it because his professors told him that's how it formed, right? Two questions. And you know what else is interesting? We have seen canyons form rapidly. That's right. In fact, I don't know, are there any known exceptions? I mean, it's, it's like we've got all these examples where you've had, even here in Texas, canyons form rapidly when yep. a dam burst or something like that. Um, you know, we, we, we do have observations to support that. That's true. You know, all you have to know is he did not walk away convinced. But he had six. He was the one leading that 16-day raft trip. He had 16 days on that raft to think about that as he looked at all of that geology going down there. Did it change his mind? Probably not. But two years down the road, ten years down the road, might that have planted a seed? We may never know in this lifetime, but all we can do is do the best we can and share with others as we see those opportunities. Absolutely. That's fantastic. That's yeah. great. Uh, so I'm going to bring us back a little bit. You had mentioned, uh, that your journey kind of, not the original journey, but there was a huge portion of astrophotography. So, uh, I'll pose a question to you. What do you think about the James Webb telescope? Uh, have you seen, uh, some of the images from there? Uh, what do you think we're going to continue to find, uh, I'm really excited about the James Webb Telescope. Uh, we haven't gotten enough data back yet uh, to, to really start to dive into it. But we know the power of the James Webb Telescope compared to the, the Hubble Telescope, even though we're this different, it is spectacular. What we're about to learn in astronomy is probably going to shock us. The What is going to be revealed through the experiments that will be conducted via the James Webb is probably going to open up new areas of scientific discovery. Here's what I'm confident in. Those new areas of scientific discovery, even though they might try to be interpreted in an atheistic perspective, are actually going to be leading us closer and closer to the truth. Um, that there is a designer for the universe. And you know, I'm really excited about where science is headed because I see this shift. Charles Spurgeon, who wasn't strong on creation by any means, but Charles Spurgeon did understand the dangers of evolution, okay? He was known as the prince of preachers, and he said one day children will laugh at evolution and that people will consider it to be the most foolish notion that ever crossed the human mind. I agree. I think that day might actually be a lot closer than most people think. Now, Will it be replaced with something equally as ludicrous? Probably so. Maybe even more ludicrous. But at the same time, science is making so much progress, I don't think that they can hold on to these antiquated Darwinian views that are hundreds of years old, that have been uh, proven false many, many times over by simple observations. We're coming to this crossroads in science where we may have a major opportunity to, to really take a frank look at things. And it might be right around the corner. Wow, it's exciting. Dr. Hebert, what about you? I know that uh, you've got some major problems with the Big Bang cos cosmology. Right. Uh, what do you think that we're gonna see from this? Well, I think we're probably gonna see uh, some of the same things that we've already seen. You know, one of the problems for the Big Bang is that you have galaxies that are supposedly just two or three hundred million years after the Big Bang. I mean, they, they supposedly they're forming right after the Big Bang, and yet they look very mature. Uh, they have continually been surprised because in Big Bang reckoning, they think it takes billions of years for that light to get here. Therefore, in their minds, we're seeing these galaxies not as they are today, but as they were shortly after the Big Bang. So they ought to be very immature, undeveloped, and yet we're seeing 
all these examples where they we where we have fully developed galaxies, galaxies that are very mature looking, they've continually been surprised by that. I think we're going to see more more of that. Yeah, I, I will, and we'll probably see a lot more as well. But I think we're for sure going to see that. The deeper that you peer into the cosmos, I mean that ultra deep field with the Hubble right, right. was astounding. And it already inspired everyone at the grandeur of the universe, right? What the James Webb is going to see is just going to surpass that to a certain extent. But ultimately, it reminds me of that old Stuart Hamblin song, How Big Is God, mm -hmm. right? Because when you realize the grandeur of the cosmos, you see that the creator of that cosmos has to transcend that because he's even outside of the universe. That's something that a lot of atheists don't seem to get is basically, and I'm simplifying here, but energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Einstein told us that matter is an expression of energy, so therefore matter can neither be created nor destroyed, just change shape. So when we realize that it breaks natural laws to create a universe from nothing, what does that mean? That means that the universe must have, the only other alternative is it was created in the supernatural world by someone outside of the universe who has the ability to change and create laws and physics of the universe. That's God. That's who he claims to be, right? And so to believe in a universe from random chance and nothing is pseudoscience. It breaks physical laws and of science and nature. We've got the high ground. I tell people all the time, it's like uh, it's like David and Goliath, okay? Uh, if you if you've been out to Israel in the no. uh, when you're you're standing on the mountain where the Israelites were standing, you're looking across to a lower hill where the Philistines lay, okay? All right, and there's a valley in between, mm -hmm. the Elah Valley, where David picked up those five smooth stones, right? Now, I'm standing there on this mountain, looking across the hillside, down at this other hill, and I realize, well, Israel had the high ground, but they were intimidated by Goliath. All right, today, we've got the high ground, and yet too often, we're intimidated by the worldly Goliaths of evolution, of natural selection, of all of these things that we're being told, right? We have the high ground. We're standing on God's word, looking down at these false theories, and yet we're like, I don't know, am I gonna be looked at as foolish if I try to tell people that, that evolution is, is you know, completely against science? Am I, are my friends really gonna think something strange about me if I tell them that I'm a Christian, that I believe the Bible, that I believe everything's created? No, no, no. You've got the scientific high ground, you've got the intellectual high ground, and you are standing on God's word. We shouldn't be ashamed. We've got to boldly go forward and share this information with whoever we might meet. We can't be ashamed of it. Amen. What would y'all say then to, we, we talked about education and people with PhDs and professors. We, we mentioned churches as well, but what about the pastors, maybe people like Spurgeon or others more recent, more current, who pastors who aren't holding to the reality of Genesis, the history that we see there? What would y'all say? Well, I mean, obviously, I think they're making a mistake. And I think they, uh, you know, this idea of intimidation, there's really something to that. Um, I think a lot of these um, prominent atheistic science spokespersons, they almost, it's almost like they want you to think they are so vastly more intelligent than everybody else that even though they're saying something that sounds nonsensical, well, there must be some hidden logic right. to it that I don't see. And since I'm just a lay person, I can't, I po I can't possibly uh, comprehend it's on such a high level. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think um, it, it really is that foolish. And uh, um, I could tell you this, just from my own experience, I don't think most scientists, myself are included, is, are as smart as you think they are. <laughs> I just don't think that's true. I think, and I think uh, there's a lot, there is a big intimidation factor out there. And uh, Satan uses that to very good effect. And, you know, I, I, uh, my pastor a while back pointed out something that was very interesting. He was talking about how the scriptures compare Satan to a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. And a roar is a method of intimidation. Yes. 
The roar really by itself can't hurt you, but it can intimidate you. And I think Satan does a lot of that. And uh, I just, uh, it's, it's, it, it saddens me that so many Christians seem to be running away from a straightforward understanding of the Scriptures um, when the evidence for biblical, not, not just intelligent design, not just um, creation, biblical creation is stronger than it's ever been. And uh, I just, it's, um, yeah, it, it's hard. It's, it's frustrating because I know they're wrong, uh, but I just, I, I don't, it's, I, I, I don't, it, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just, uh, well, one thing I can tell you this, I, I will say this. I think some of it is sheer intellectual pride. Mm -hmm. And I think some people out there just, don't want to look foolish. And you know what? If you're going to be faithful to Christ, you may have to look foolish at some point. You may have to say, I don't know the answer to your question. Yes. But, but where, they, where they, I think, run an intellectual con with everybody is they never apply that same standard to themselves. You know, when, when you have students in college, you have these professors, these atheistic professors who will try to intimidate the Christian kids and, and make them feel stupid if they don't know the answer to every single objection that, 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 that the professor throws at them. Yeah. But I guarantee you that professor doesn't hold himself to that same standard. Okay, now if he were interested in being intellectually honest, he would let the students question him and ask him tough questions about his worldview. But I guarantee you he won't do that because they can easily make him look foolish too. So this idea that you're not allowed to have a worldview unless you've got every single question answered already is just absurd because nobody really believes that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to believe anything. You wouldn't. You couldn't have any worldview at all. So you know, there's the intimidation factor. Um, it, I, and I think this. By the way, I think there's this is another issue. You know, a, a lot of Christians they, they're like, well, I'm not going to believe the Bible until I get every single question answered mm -hmm. first. And the problem with that is you're never going to get every question answered in this life, okay? Uh, and you know what? If you're going you're to say, well, I'm going to be an evolutionist, guess what? You're not going to get every question answered there either. And so, you know, sometimes you have to be like a child. You know, if, you have a, if your dad's an electrical engineer and he's trying to explain electricity to you, you need to just be quiet and humble yourself and accept what he's telling you because you don't know enough to, to you know, and but this idea that I'm I'm not going to accept what God tells me until I fully understand, we don't do that in real life. Yeah. When you're a child, and you know the Bible talks about being like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, you just accept what your parents tell you, uh, and of course sometimes that that trust is unwarranted, you know, because they're sinful, uh, but. You know, this, I think sometimes uh, some Christians think way too highly of their own intellects and um, frankly need to humble themselves. Well, that was the title of my, my first book. It was based on a passage in Job that says that God does great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. And I'm yeah. chewing that over in my head and I'm like, boy, this is true because there are some things in this life. God has done great things past finding out. We'll never know. We'll never fully understand. But I tell you what, He's done an innumerable number of wonders, wonders without number, that we can study, yeah. that we can use science, observation, uh, that we can look at, and we're faced with really only two options. We can give Him the glory for it, or we can say, oh, look at what time and chance has accomplished. And sadly, so many people today have chosen that second option. But at the same time, when we just realize that there are mysteries of the cosmos that will never be fully understood because God has done these great miracles in His creation. Uh, what we need to do is focus on the ones that we can give Him the glory for, that we can study, and point those out to people who may be wondering, who may be searching. Absolutely, That's fantastic. Well, uh, just as in closing, do you all have any encouragement for any listeners or viewers who may really be struggling with their own faith versus science journey. Yeah, well, I, I would just say that the, the facts are all out there. You can have 100% confidence that the scripture is true. It's been validated so many times, and 
in those areas where we haven't figured it out, just, just wait a year or two. Yeah. I mean, with everything that's happening, just wait a year or two. We are consistently and constantly finding these things that are pointing right back to God. But you know, I mean, I... When I started taking pictures of stars and galaxies and nebulae, and I realized that some of those galaxies are so far away that we can't even comprehend. Galaxies that would take us hundreds of millions of years if we were traveling at the speed of our fastest unmanned spacecraft currently in existence. Galaxies that are so unfathomable and so large, containing hundreds of billions of stars. Again, it points back, how big is God? He's so big that he created this entire universe and yet wanted to be small enough to reduce himself to flesh, to come here on this earth, to live, die, and be raised again so that we could be a part of his family for eternity. I mean, you think about the love that he has for us. This all points right back to the gospel. It's not about science. It's about using these scientific principles to glorify the creator and to point back to who he truly is and how much he cares for us, it's all out there. All we have to do is just keep searching, is to have faith and confidence in His Word. It holds the truth every time. And then sit back and enjoy the ride. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I would just um, say to people, do not let uh, people intimidate you. Uh, you know, a lot of these arguments, you don't really necessarily have to be a specialist to understand. I mean, you know, the evidence for the flood... The fact that these are water-deposited rocks, you know, the fossils in them, a lot of this is pretty straightforward to understand. And um, I think if you if you are willing to take the time to read the creation literature and compare it with the evolutionary literature, I think you're going to see we've got the stronger case. But a lot of people just don't want to do that. Uh, and so, uh, and, you know, we have to back up what we say. You know, we've got footnotes, we got references for people who want to go back and dig a little bit deeper. But um, I think what you will find quickly is if you search this issue thoroughly, is you're going to see that there's a lot of basically hot air out there <laughs> that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And, um, you know, the creation position really is far and away the better position. It is. And you again, you don't have to know everything. You mentioned right. that a moment ago. When I first got my television program and I'm sitting there and they said, you know, invite whoever you want. So I'm like, Jake, would you come on? Uh, <laughs> Tim Cleary, would you come on? This, And when you're sitting there with all of these PhDs in every field imaginable, whether it's genetics or astrophysics or biology or whatever, it really is a faith builder. We really need to understand that we can study these things, that we can research and learn from other individuals who have done a lot of research. We really appreciate what ICR has accomplished and uh, your research into climate and Ice Age and everything that you've, uh, that you've poured in, all of those hours. Yeah. Because as a community, as the body of Christ, but also as a community, we can all get together and use our specialties just to reach the world with the truth of creation and ultimately with the gospel message. Yeah. 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 And I love it. There's a concept of science pointing us really to worship our Creator and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love what you said too about don't be intimidated, right. have the faith of a child, be constantly trying to learn and go to ministries like David Reeves Ministries, ICR, and others to learn and continue to build your knowledge so you can talk. And then one other um, thing that somebody else on staff has said before too is to ask questions. You, you alluded to that earlier too is what led you to believe that? How did you come to that conclusion? Right. And just kind of have them reveal their own worldview and whether they have a, an, an ac adequate, accurate defense. So that's really great advice. Yeah. Thank you. And question on that, how can people find you online? <laughs> uh, probably the easiest way is davidreeves.com, David, R-I-V-E-S dot com. That'll get you to the television shows, Genesis Science Network, the Creation Superstore, Creation Club Magazine. Sign up for email updates and uh, and the magazine. Both of those are 100% free. And, um, and then 
we're really excited. We're actually working on a, a very large museum in Nashville, Tennessee, which will soon house a, a lot of artifacts and a, a really nice science museum out there to give glory to the Creator. So be praying about that. Look for, um, look for that news when you sign up for the email updates. We'll announce that soon. That's Wonderful. that's exciting, and we'll we'll include a link below for our listeners and viewers. So, awesome! Thank y'all so much for being here and just spending time with us. And thank y'all for joining us. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share, and man, just get the word out and pray for us if you can. And we'll see you next time on Creation Live.